After Apple Picking by Robert Frost Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson By long two-pointed ladders sticking through a tree toward heaven still, And there's a barrel that I didn't fill beside it, And there may be two or three apples I didn't pick upon some bough. But I am done with apple picking now. Essence of winter sleep is on the night, the scent of apples. I am drowsing off. I cannot rub the strangeness from my sight I got from looking through a pane of glass I skimmed this morning from the drinking trough and held against the world a hoary grass. It melted, and I let it fall and break. But I was well upon my way to sleep before it fell, and I could tell what form my dreaming was about to take. Magnified apples appear and disappear, stem end and blossom end, and every fleck of russet showing clear. My instep arch not only keeps the ache, it keeps the pressure of a ladder round. I feel the ladder sway as the boughs bend, and I keep hearing from the cellar bin the rumbling sound of load on load of apples coming in. For I have had too much of apple picking. I am overtired of the great harvest I myself desired. There were ten thousand thousand fruit to touch, cherish in hand, lift down, and not let fall. For all that struck the earth, no matter if it bruised or spiked with stubble, went surely to the cider apple heap as of no worth. One can see what will trouble this sleep of mine, whatever sleep it is. Were he not gone, the woodchuck could say whether it's like his long sleep, as I describe its coming on, or just some human sleep. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Afterthought by Jean Ingello Read for LibriVox.org by Rohan Fryer Man dwells apart though not alone he walks among his peers unread best of thoughts which he hath known for lack of listeners are not said yet dreaming on earth's clustered isles he saith they dwell not lone like men forgetful that their sun-flecked smiles flash far beyond each other's ken he looks on god's eternal suns that sprinkle the celestial blue and saith ah happy shining ones i would that men were grouped like you yet this is sure the loveliest star that clustered with its peer we see only because from us so far doth near its fellows seem to be end of poem this recording is in the public domain the ant explorer by Clarence James Dennis Read for LibriVox.org by 7ML3 Once a little sugar ant made up his mind to roam, to fare away, far away, far away from home. He had eaten all his breakfast, and he had his ma's consent, to see what he should chance to see, and here's the way he went. Up and down a fern frond, round and round a stone, down a gloomy gully where he loathed to be alone, up a mighty mountain range seven inches high, through the fearful forest grass that nearly hid the sky, out along a bracken bridge bending in the moss, till he reached a dreadful desert that was feet and feet across. Twas a dry deserted desert and a trackless land to tread. He wished that he was home again and tucked up tight in bed. His little legs were wobbly, his strength was nearly spent, and so he turned around again, and here's the way he went. Back along a bracken bridge, bending in the moss, through a fearful forest grass, shutting out the sky, up a mighty mountain range, seven inches high, down a gloomy gully where he loathed to be alone, up and down a fern frowned, round and round a stone. A dreary ant, a weary ant, resolved no more to roam. He staggered up the garden path and popped back home. End of The Ant Explorer this recording is in the public domain. Aristodemus's Truthful Speech in Noble Sparta by Alcaeus of Mytilene 
625 to 580 bc from the lives and opinions of eminent philosophers by diogenes laertius read for LibriVox.org. and so they say aristodemus once uttered a truthful speech in noble sparta tis money makes the man and he who is none is counted neither good nor honorable end of poem this recording is in the public domain the ass and the flute by thomas de iriate read for librivox dot org by chad horner located in ballyclare county antrim northern ireland this little fable heard it good or ill may be but it has just occurred thus accidentally passing my abode some fields adjoining me a big ass on his road came accidentally and laid upon the spot a flute he chanced to see some shepherd had forgot there accidentally the animal in front to scan it nigh came he and snuffing loud as want blew accidentally the air it chanced around the pipe went passing free and thus to flit a sound give accidentally oh then exclaimed the ass i know to play it fine and who for bad shall class the music as a name without the rules of art e'en asses we agree may once succeed in part thus accidentally end of poem this recording is in the public domain A Ballad of Dreamland by Algernon Charles Swinburne Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist I hid my heart in a nest of roses Out of the sun's way, hidden apart In a softer bed than the soft white snows is Under the roses I hid my heart Why would it sleep not? Why should it start when never a leaf of the rose tree stirred? What made sleep flutter his wings and part? Only the song of a secret bird. Lie still, I said, for the wind's wing closes and mild leaves muffle the keen sun's dart. Lie still for the wind on the warm sea dozes and the wind is unquieter yet than thou art does a thought in thee still as a thorn's wound smart does the fang still fret thee of hope deferred what bids the lids of thy sleep depart only the song of a secret bird the green land's name that a charm encloses it never was writ in the traveller's chart and sweet on its trees as the fruit that grows is it never was sold in the merchant's mart the swallows of dreams through its dim fields dart and sleeps are the tunes in its tree-tops heard no hound's note wakens the wild wood heart only the song of a secret bird in the world of dreams i have chosen my part to sleep for a season and hear no word of true love's truth or of light love's art only the song of a secret bird end of poem this recording is in the public domain A Birthday Gift by Robert F. Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Mike Overby One day after his twenty-sixth birthday No gift I bring but worship And the love which all must bear To lovely souls and pure Those lights that, when all else is dark, endure Stars in the nights to lift our eyes above To lift our eyes and hearts And make us move less doubtful though our journey be obscure, less fearful of its ending,
being sure that they watch over this, where'er we rove. And though my gift itself have little worth, yet worth it gains from her to whom tis given, as a weak flower gets color from the sun. Or, rather, as when angels walk the earth, all things they look on take the look of heaven. For of those blessed angels thou art one. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Brown Penny by William Butler Yeats Read for LibriVox.org by Edmund Agabau I whispered, I am too young, and then I am old enough, wherefore I threw a penny to find out if I might love. Go and love, go and love, young man, if the lady be young and fair. Ah, Penny! Brown penny, brown penny, I am looped in the loops of her hair. O oh, love is the crooked thing, there is nobody wise enough to find out all that is in it, for he would be thinking of love till the stars had run away and the shadows eaten the moon. Ah, penny, brown penny, brown penny, one cannot begin it too soon. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Cast and Christ by H. E. B. Stowe. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. He is not ashamed to call them brethren. Ho, oh, thou dark and weary stranger from the tropics' palmy strand! Bowed with toil, with mind benighted, What wouldst thou upon our land? Am I not, O man, thy brother? Spake the stranger patiently. All that makes thee, man, immortal, Tell me, dwells it not in me? I, like thee, have joy, have sorrow. I, like thee, have love and fear. I, like thee, have hopes and longings Far beyond this earthly sphere. Thou art happy, I am sorrowing. Thou art rich, and I am poor. In the name of our one Father, do not spurn me from your door. Thus the dark one spake, imploring to each stranger passing nigh. But each child and man and woman, priest and Levite, passed him by. Spurned of men, despised, rejected, spurned from school and church and hall, spurned from business and from pleasure, sad he stood apart from all then i saw a form all glorious spotless as the dazzling light as he passed men veiled their faces and the earth as heaven grew bright spake he to the dusky stranger awestruck there on bended knee rise for i have called thee brother i am not ashamed of thee when i wedded mortal nature to my godhead and my throne then i made all mankind sacred sealed all human for mine own for myself the lord of ages i have sworn to right the wrong i have pledged my word unbroken for the weak against the strong and upon my gospel banner i have blazed in light the sign he who scorns his lowliest brother never shall have hand of mine hear the word who fight for freedom shout it in the battle's van hope for bleeding human nature christ the god is christ the man in the poem this recording is in the public domain the complaints of the poor by robert southey read for LibriVox.org by andrew gantz and wherefore do the poor complain the rich man asked of me Come, walk abroad with me, I said, and I will answer thee. T'was evening, and the frozen streets were cheerless to behold, and we were wrapped and coated well, and yet we were a cold. We met an old bare-headed man, his locks were few and white. I asked him what he did abroad in that cold winter's night. T'was bitter keen indeed, he said, but at home no fire had he, and therefore he had come abroad to ask for charity. 
We met a young barefooted child, and she begged loud and bold. I asked her what she did abroad when the wind it blew so cold. She said her father was at home and he lay sick abed, and therefore it was she was sent abroad to beg for bread. We saw a woman sitting down upon a stone to rest. She had a baby at her back and another at her breast. I asked her why she loitered there when the wind it was so chill. She turned her head and bade the child that screamed behind be still. She told us that her husband served a soldier far away, and therefore to her parish she was begging back her way. We met a girl, her dress was loose and sunken was her eye, who with the wanton hollow's voice addressed the passers-by. I asked her what there was in guilt that could her heart allure to shame disease and late remorse. She answered, she was poor. I turned me to the rich man then, for silently stood he. You asked me why the poor complain, and these have answered thee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Crows by Louise Bogan. Read for LibriVox.org by Phil Schempf. The woman who has grown old and knows desire must die, yet turns to love again, hears the crows cry. She is a stem long hardened, a weed that no side mows. The heart's laughter will be to her the crying of the crows, who slide in the air with the same voice over what yields not and what yields alike in spring and when there is only bitter winter burning in the fields end of poem this recording is in the public domain cupid restored to sight by anna cora mollet read for LibriVox.org by kelly taylor august twenty ninth twenty twenty www.tla dot wapshot press dot org said sophie one day with an air of conceit to the amorous suitor that sighed at her feet oh no i'll not marry what charm e'er can bind since cupid once wedded no longer is blind delusion takes wing as the bridal torch died and hymen too surely gives love back his eyes then ere the moon wanes who knows but he'll trace deformity strange in the once worshipped face believe it not dearest the fond swain replied and smiled as the lady still doubtingly sighed Ah, wherefore the sight he regains should you rue? Tis but given your virtues more clearly to view. End of poem. This reading is in the public domain. The Difference by Thomas Hardy Read for LibriVox.org by Ike Scher. Sinking down by the gate, I discern the thin moon, and a blackbird tries over old airs in the pine. But the moon is a sorry one, sad the bird's tune, for this spot is unknown to that heartmate of mine. Did my heartmate but haunt here at times such as now, the song would be joyous and cheerful the moon. But she will see never this gate, path, or bough, Nor I find a joy in the scene or the tune. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Distressed Shepherdess, or Mariana's Complaint for the Death of Damon, by Philip Freneau. Read for LibriVox.org by M. Lee. What madness compelled my dear shepherd to go to the siege of Quebec and distract me with woe? My heart is so full it would kill me to tell 
how he died on the banks of the river Sorel. O river Sorel, thou didst hear him complain, when dying he languished and called me in vain. When pierced by the Briton he went to repel, he sunk on the shores of the river Sorel. O cruel misfortune, my hopes to destroy, he has left me alone with my Colin, his boy. With sorrow I see him, with tears my eyes swell. Shall we go, my sweet babe, to the river Sorel? But why should I wander and give him such pain? My Damon will ne'er see his Colin again. To wander so far where the wild Indians dwell, we should faint ere we came to the river Sorel. But even to see the pale corpse of my dear would give me such rapture, such pleasure sincere. I'll go, my dear boy, and my grief I will tell to the willows that grow by the river Sorel. How shall I distinguish my shepherd's dear grave amidst the long forest that darkens the wave? Perhaps they could give him no tomb when he fell. Perhaps he is sunk in the river Sorel. He was a dear fellow. Oh, had he remained! For he was uneasy whene'er I complained. He called me his charmer and called me his bell. What a folly to die on the banks of Sorel! Then let me remain in my lonely retreat. My shepherd departed, I never shall meet. Here's Billy O'Bluster, I love him as well. And Damon may stay at the river Sorel. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Elegy 13 of Funeral Elegies of Francis Quarles Read for LibriVox.org by M. Lee No, no, he is not dead, the mouth of fame. Honor shrill herald would preserve his name and make it live in spite of death and dust. Were there no other heaven, no other trust? He is not dead, the sacred nine deny. The soul that merits fame should ever die. He lives, and when the last breath of fame shall want her trump to glorify a name. He shall survive in these self-closed eyes that now lie slumbering in the dust shall rise, and filled with endless glory shall enjoy the perfect vision of eternal joy. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Epitaph on John Adams of Southwell, a carrier who died of drunkenness. By Lord Byron. Read for LibriVox.org by E. J. Lavery. John Adams lies here of the parish of Southwell, a carrier who carried his can to his mouth well. He carried so much and he carried so fast, he could carry no more, so was carried at last. For the liquor he drank being too much for one, he could not carry off, so he's now carry on. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Epitaph on the Honourable Miss Drummond in the Church of Brodsworth, Yorkshire by William Mason Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Epitaph on the Honourable Miss Drummond in the Church of Brodsworth, Yorkshire Here sleeps what once was beauty, once was grace grace that with tenderness and sense combined to form that harmony of soul and face where beauty shines the mirror of the mind such was the maid that in the morn of youth in virgin innocence in nature's pride blessed with each art that owes its charm to truth sunk in her father's fond embrace and died he weeps o oh, venerate the holy tear faith lends her aid to ease affliction's load the parent mourns his child upon her bier the christian yields an angel to his god end of poem this recording is in the public domain evening by the seaside by alfred meissner translated by alfred baskerville Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist In evening's glow, O oh sea, Beside thy waves at rest, My torments seem to flee, And peace reigns in my breast. My burning heart forgets Its struggles and its pain, 
each wailing cry begets a soft melodious strain scarce doth a gentle pain steal softly through the mind as o'er the ocean's plain a sail before the wind end of poem this recording is in the public domain an evening thought salvation by christ with penitential cries by jupiter hammond read for LibriVox.org by evan mantler salvation comes by christ alone the only son of god redemption now to every one that love his holy word dear jesus we would fly to thee and leave off every sin thy tender mercy well agree salvation from our king salvation comes now from the lord our victorious king his holy name be well adored salvation surely bring dear jesus give thy spirit now thy grace to every nation that hant the lord to whom we bow the author of salvation dear jesus unto thee we cry give us the preparation turn not away thy tender eye we seek thy true salvation salvation comes from god we know the true and only one it's well agreed and certain true he gave his only son lord hear our penitential cry salvation from above it is the lord that doth supply with his redeeming love dear jesus by thy precious blood the world redemption have salvation now comes from the lord he being thy captive slave dear jesus let the nations cry and all the people say salvation comes from christ on high haste on tribunal day we cry as sinners to the lord salvation to obtain it is firmly fixed his holy word ye shall not cry in vain dear jesus unto thee we cry and make our lamentation O oh, let our prayers ascend on high we felt thy salvation lord turn our dark benighted souls give us a true motion and let the hearts of all the world make christ their salvation ten thousand angels cry to thee yea louder than the ocean thou art the lord we plainly see thou art the true salvation now is the day expected time the day of the salvation increase your faith do not repine awake ye every nation lord unto whom now shall we go or seek a safe abode thou hast the world salvation too the only son of god ho every one that hunger hath or pineth after me salvation be thy leading staff to set the sinner free dear jesus unto thee we fly depart depart from sin salvation doth at length supply the glory of our king come ye blessed of the lord salvation greatly given O oh, turn your hearts, accept the word, your souls are fit for heaven. Dear Jesus, we now turn to thee, salvation to obtain. Our hearts and souls do meet again, to magnify thy name. Come, Holy Spirit, heavenly dove, the object of our care. Salvation doth increase our love, our hearts have felt they fear. Now glory be to God on high, salvation high and low and thus the soul on christ rely to heaven surely go come blessed jesus heavenly dove accept repentance here salvation give with tender love let us with angels share finis end of poem this recording is in the public domain A Farewell to Arms by George Steele Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug His golden locks time hath to silver turned, O oh, dime too swift, O oh, swiftness never ceasing. His youth gainst time and age hath ever spurned, But spurned in vain, youth waneth by increasing. Beauty, strength, youth, are flowers but fading seen duty faith love are roots and evergreen his helmet now shall make a hive for bees 
Her lover's sonnets turned to holy psalms. A man at arms must now serve on his knees and feed on prayers, which are age his arms. But though from court to cottage he depart, his saint is sure of his unspotted heart. And when he saddest sits in homely cell, he'll teach his swains this carol for a song. Blessed be the hearts that wish my sovereign well, Cursed be the souls that think her any wrong. Goddess, allow this aged man his right to be your beadsman now that was your knight. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Fifteenth Farewell by Louise Bogan. Read for LibriVox.org by Phil Schempf. You may have all things from me, save my breath. The slight life in my throat will not give pause for your love, nor your loss, nor any cause. Shall I be made a panderer to death? Dig the green ground for darkness underneath. Let the dust serve me, covering all that was with all that will be. Better from time's claws the hardened face underneath the stubble wreath, cooler than stones in wells sweeter more kind than hot perfidious words my breathing moves close to my plunging blood be strong and hang unriven mist over my breast and mind my breath we shall forget the heart that loves though in my body beat its blade and its fang i erred when i thought loneliness the wide scent of mown grass over forsaken fields or any shadow isolation yields loneliness was the heart within your side your thought beyond my touch was tilted air ringed with as many borders as the wind how could i judge you gentle or unkind when all bright flying space was in your care now that i leave you i shall be made lonely by simple empty days never that chill resonant heart to strike between my arms again as though diswrought for distance only levels of evening now behind a hill or a late cock crow from the darkening farms end of poem this recording is in the public domain the frog who wished to be as big as the ox by jen de la fontaine read for librivox dot org by sarah jobber there was a little frog whose home was in a bog and he worried cause he wasn't big enough he sees an ox and cries that's just about my size if i stretch myself say sister see me puff so he blew 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 saying sister will that do but she shook her head and then he lost his wits for he stretched and puffed again till he cracked beneath the strain and burst and flew about in little bits end of the frog who wished to be as big as the ox by jen de la fontaine this recording is in the public domain The Grasshopper and the Ant by Jen de la Fontaine. Read for LibriVox.org by Sarah Jobber. The Grasshopper and the Ant by Jen de la Fontaine. The grasshopper singing all summer long, now found winter stinging, and ceased in his song. Not a morsel or crumb in his cupboard, so he shivered and ceased in his song. Miss Ant was his neighbor, to her he went. Oh, you're rich from labor, and I've not a cent. Lend me food, and I vow I'll return it, though at present I have not a cent. The ant's not a lender, I must confess. Her heart's far from tender to one in distress. So she said, Pray, how pass you the summer, that in winter you come to distress? I sang through the summer, grasshopper said, but now I am glummer, because I've no bread. So you sang, sneered the ant, that relieves me. Now it's winter, go dance for your bread. End of... The Grasshopper and the Ant by Jen de la Fontaine. This recording is in the public domain. Hidden Sorrows by Alfred Kastner King. Read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Gantz. For some, the river of life would seem free from the shallow, the reef, or bar. 
as they gently glide down the silvery stream with scarcely a ripple, a lurch, or jar. But under the surface, calm and fair, lurk the hidden snags and the secret care. The waters are deepest where still and clear, and the sternest anguish forbids a tear. For others, the pathway of life is strewn with many a thorn for each rose or bud, and their journey o'er mountain or moor and dune can be plainly tracked by footprints of blood. But deeper still lies the hidden smart of some secret sorrow which gnaws the heart and rankles under a surface clear, for the sternest anguish forbids a tear. But when the journey's end we see, at the bar of the judge of quick and dead, the cross which the one bore silently may outweigh his of the blood-stained tread. The cross unseen and the cross of light may balance in that judge's sight. Or the heart that is breaking a smile may appear, for the sternest anguish forbids a tear. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. If There Were Dreams to Sell by Louis Chandler Moulton, read for LibriVox.org, by Edmund Agabal. If there were dreams to sell, what would you buy? If there were dreams to sell, do I not know full well what I would buy? Hope's dear delusive spell, its happy tale to tell, joy's fleeting sigh. I would be young again, youth's maddening bliss and bane I would recapture, though it were keen with pain. All else seems void and vain to that fine rapture. I would be glad once more, slip through an open door into life's glory, keep what I spent of yore, find what I lost before, hear an old story. As it one day befell, breaking death's frozen spell, love should draw nigh. If there were dreams to sell, do I know too well what I would buy? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Inch Cape Rock by Robert Southey. Read for LibriVox.org by Daniel Davison. The Inch Cape Rock. No stir in the air, no stir in the sea. The ship was still as she could be. Her sails from heaven received no motion, Her keel was steady in the ocean. Without either sign or sound of their shock, The waves flowed over the inch cape rock. So little they rose, so little they fell, They did not move the inch cape bell. The abbot of Aberbrothok Had placed that bell on the inch cape rock, on a buoy in the storm it floated and swung, And over the waves its warning rung. When the rock was hid by the surge's swell, The mariners heard the warning bell, And then they knew the perilous rock, And blessed the abbot of Aberbrothok. The sun in heaven was shining gay, All things were joyful on that day, the sea birds screamed as they wheeled round, and there was joyance in their sound. The buoy of the inch cape bell was seen, a darker speck on the ocean green. Sir Ralph the rover walked his deck, and he fixed his eye on the darker speck. He felt the cheering power of spring. It made him whistle, it made him sing. His heart was mirthful to excess, But the rover's mirth was wickedness. His eye was on the inch-cape float. Quoth he, my men, put out the boat, And row me to the inch-cape rock, And I'll plague the abbot of Aberbrothok. The boat is lowered, the boatmen row, And to the inch-cape rock they go. Sir Ralph bent over from the boat, And he caught the bell from the inch-cape float. Down sunk the bell with a gurgling sound, The bubbles rose and burst around. 
quoth Sir Ralph, the next who comes to the rock won't bless the abbot of Aberbrothock. Sir Ralph the rover sailed away, he scoured the seas for many a day, and now grown rich with plundered store, he steers his course for Scotland's shore. So thick a haze o'er spreads the sky, they cannot see the sun on high. The wind hath blown a gale all day, at evening it hath died away. On the deck the rover takes his stand, so dark it is they see no land. Quoth Sir Ralph, it will be lighter soon, for there is the dawn of the rising moon. Canst hear, said one, the breakers roar, for methinks we should be near the shore. Now where we are I cannot tell, but I wish I could hear the inch cape bell. They hear no sound, the swell is strong, though the wind hath fallen they drift along, till the vessel strikes with a shivering shock. Oh Christ, it is the inch cape rock! Sir Ralph the Rover tore his hair, he cursed himself in his despair. The waves rush in on every side, the ship is sinking beneath the tide. But even in his dying fear, one dreadful sound could the Rover hear, a sound as if with the inch cape bell, the devil below was ringing his knell. End of the Inch Cape Rock by Robert Southey. This recording is in the public domain. I See and Am Satisfied by Kelly Miller. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. The vision of a scion of a despised and rejected race, the span of whose life is measured by the years of its golden jubilee and whose fancy, like the vine that girdles the tree-trunk, runneth both forward and back. I see the African savage as he drinks his palmy wine, and basks in the sunshine of his native bliss, and is happy. I see the man-catcher, impelled by thirst of gold, as he entraps his simple-souled victim in the snares of bondage and death, by use of force or guile. I see the ocean basin withered with his bones, and the ocean current running red with his blood amidst the hellish horrors of the middle passage. I see him laboring for two centuries and a half in unrequited toil, making the hillsides of our Southland to glow with the snow-white fleece of cotton, and the valleys to glisten with the golden sheaves of grain. I see him silently enduring cruelty and torture indescribable, with flesh flinching beneath the scythes of angry whip or quivering under the gnaw of a sharp-toothed bloodhound. I see a chivalric civilization, instinct with dignity, comity and grace rising upon pillars supported by his strength and brawny arm. I see the swarthy matron lavishing her soul in altruistic devotion upon the offspring of her alabaster mistress. I see the haughty sons of a haughty race pouring out their lustful passion upon black womanhood, filling our land with bronzed and tawny brood. I see also the patriarchal solicitude of the kindly-hearted owners of men, in whose breast not even iniquitous system could sour the milk of human kindness. I hear the groans, the sorrows, the sighings, the soul-striving of these benighted creatures of God, rising up from the low grounds of sorrow, and reaching the ear of him who regardeth man of the lowliest estate. I strain my ear to supernal sound, and I hear in the secret chambers of the Almighty the order of the captain of host to break his bond and set him free. I see Abraham Lincoln, himself a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, arise to execute the high decree. I see two hundred thousand black boys in blue bearing their breasts to the bayonets of the enemy, that their race might have some slight part in its own deliverance. I see the great proclamation delivered in the year of my birth, of which I became the first fruit and beneficiary. 
I see the assassin striking down the great emancipator, and the house of mirth is transformed into the Golgotha of the nation. I watch the Congress as it adds to the Constitution new words which make the document a charter of liberty indeed. I see the new-made citizen running to and fro in the first fruit of his new-found freedom. I see him rioting in the flush of privilege which the nation had vouchsafed, but destined, alas, not long to last. I see him thrust down from the high seat of political power by fraud and force, while the nation looks on in sinister silence and acquiescent guilt. I see the tide of public feeling run cold and chilly, as the vial of racial wrath is wreaked upon his bowed and defenseless head. I see his body writhing in the agony of death as his groans issue from the crackling flames, while the funeral pyre lights the midnight sky with its dismal glare. My heart sinks with heaviness within me. I see that the path of progress has never taken a straight line, but has always been a zigzag course amid the conflicting forces of right and wrong, truth and error, justice and injustice, cruelty and mercy. I see that the great generous American heart, despite the temporary flutter, will finally bear true to the higher human impulse, and my soul abounds with reassurance and hope. I see his marvelous advance and the rapid acquisition of knowledge, an acquirement of things material, an attainment of the higher pursuits of life, with his face fixed upon the light which shineth brighter and brighter unto the perfect day. I see him, who was once deemed stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, now entering with universal welcome into the patrimony of mankind, and I look calmly upon the centuries of blood and tears and travail of soul, and am satisfied. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud by William Wordsworth Read for LibriVox.org by 7ML3 I wandered lonely as a cloud That floats on high over vales and hills When all at once I saw a crowd A host of golden daffodils Beside the lake, beneath the trees Fluttering and dancing in the breeze Continuous as the stars that shine And twinkle on the milky way the stretched in never-ending line along the margin of a bay. Ten thousand saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth to me the show had brought. For oft, when on my couch I lie, in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills, and dances with the daffodils. End of I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud. This recording is in the public domain. Jenny Kissed Me by James Lee Hunt Read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Kennedy Jenny kissed me when we met, jumping from the chair she sat in. Time, you thief who love to get sweets into your list, put that in. Sam weary, Sam sad, say that health and wealth have missed me. Sam growing old, but add, Jenny kissed me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Joy in Death by Emily Dickinson Read for LibriVox.org by Mike Overby, Midland, Washington If tolling bell, I ask the cause. A soul has gone to God, I'm answered in a lonesome tone. Is heaven then so sad? That bells should joyful ring to tell a soul had gone to heaven would seem to me the proper way a good news should be given. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Keep Tryin' by Edwin C. Rank Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk 
when you're feelin blue as ink and your spirits gin to sink don't be weak and take a drink but keep tryin there are times when all of us get riled up and start a muss but there ain't no use to cuss just keep tryin when things seem to go awry and the sun desert your sky don't sit down somewhere and cry but keep tryin everybody honors grit men who never whine a bit men who tell the world i mit and keep tryin get a hustle on you now make a great big solemn vow that you'll win out anyhow and keep tryin all the world's a battlefield where the true man is revealed but the ones who never yield keep tryin end of poem this recording is in the public domain a lady by amy lowell read for LibriVox.org by elise d you are beautiful and faded like an old opera tune played upon a harpsichord or like the sun-flooded silks of an eighteenth-century boudoir in your eyes smolder the fallen roses of outlived minutes and the perfume of your soul is vague and suffusing with the pungence of sealed spice jars your half-tones delight me and i grow mad with gazing at your blent colors my vigor is a new minted penny which i cast at your feet gather it up from the dust that its sparkle may amuse you end of poem this recording is in the public domain Lent by Edwin C. Rank Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk Oh, lend me five, the young man cried, My money all is spent. The maiden shook her head and sighed, I'm sorry, but it's Lent. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Letter by Louise Bogan Read for LibriVox.org by Phil Schempf I came here, being stricken, Stumbling out at last from streets. The sun, decreasing, took me for days, The time being the last of autumn, The thickets not yet stark, But quivering with tiny colors, Like some brush strokes in the manner of the pointillists small yellows dark shaped little reds in different patterns clicks and notches of colour on threaded bushes a cracked and fluent heaven and a brown earth i had these and my food and sleep enough this is a countryside of roofless houses taverns to rain doorsteps of millstones lintels leaning and delicate foundations sprung to lilacs orchards where boughs like roots strike into the sky here i could well devise the journey to nothing at night getting down from the wagon by the black barns the zenith a point of darkness breaking to bits showering motionless stars over the houses scenes relentless the black and white grooves of a woodcut but why the journey to nothing or any desire why the heart taken by even senseless adventure the goal a coffer of dust give my mouth to the air let arrogant pain lick my flesh with a tongue rough as a cat's remember the smell of cold mornings the dried beauty of women the exquisite skin under the chins of young girls young men's rough beards the cringing promise of this one that one's apology for the knife stuck down to the bone gladioli in sick rooms asters and dahlias flowers like rutches rosettes forever enough to part grass over the stones by some brook or well the lovely seed shedding stalks to hear in the single wind diverse branches repeating their sounds to the sky 
that sky like scaled mackerel fleeing the fields to be defended from silence to feel my body as arid as safe as a twig broken away from whatever growth could snare it up to a spring or hold it softly in summer or beat it under in snow i must get well walk on strong legs leap the hurdles of sense reason again come back to my old patchwork logic addition subtraction money clothes clocks memories freesias smelling slightly of snow and of flesh in a room with blue curtains ambition despair i must feel again who had given feeling over challenge laughter take tears play the piano form judgments blame a crude world for disaster to escape is nothing not to escape is nothing the farmer's wife stands with a halo of darkness rounding her head water drips in the kitchen tapping the sink today the maples have split limb from the trunk with the ice a fresh wooden wound the vines are distorted with ice ice burdens the breaking roofs i have told you of shall i play the pavane for a dead child or the scene where the girl lets fall her hair and the loud chords descend as though her hair were metal clashing along over the tower and a dumb chord receives it this may be wisdom abstinence beauty is nothing that you regret me that i feign defiance and now i have written you this it is nothing end of poem this recording is in the public domain the little ghost by edna st vincent millay read for librivox dot org by e j lavery i knew her for a little ghost that in my garden walked the wall is high higher than most and the green gate was locked and yet i did not think of that till after she was gone i knew her by the broad white hat all ruffled she had on by the dear ruffles round her feet by her small hands that hung in their lace mitts austere and sweet her gown's white folds among i watched to see if she would stay what she would do and oh she looked as if she liked the way i let my garden grow she bent above my favorite mint with conscious garden grace she smiled and smiled there was no hint of sadness in her face she held her gown on either side to let her slippers show and up the walk she went with pride the way great ladies go and where the wall is built in new and is of ivy bare she paused then opened and passed through a gate that once was there end of poem this recording is in the public domain Meeting by Alfred Meissner, translated by Alfred Baskerville, read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist. Gliding o'er the silent waves by night, leaves the bark its trace of silver light. Thus thy presence left its silver trace, gleaming in my life's dark ocean space that fair ray that rests upon the wave in the coming tide shall find a grave but the lovely beam that lights the soul ne'er will fade while life's dark billows roll end of poem this recording is in the public domain the milk cart by john Lowe. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Milk Cart As plodding onwards to the mart and town, In boots unspurred and coat, an errant clown, With wit at will, and whistling as he went, Observed the folks on morning milk intent Around the cart, drove years by aged Anne, With scarlet cloak, beset by many a can, In which was new and buttermilk, 
that ralph had skimmed and watered like another elf for anne observed oft that as she aged good manners banished virtue evil waged a war with honest stealing therefore long to milk she added water that the throng of once might not assail her hoary head and leave her poor without a cow or bed so virtue leaves us so the tattered poor learn vice and manners at the rich man's door however so it was the cart and dobbin oped every latch and scared each lazy gobbin made all the good folks hear and to the ring each with a pitcher or a pig in spring among the chattering uproar and the throng was jeering walter who had many a song and tales of war where he had lost his leg and long adventures told of him and meg there lubin the weaver came to seek his heart found by rebeck a wench so shy and smart they all cajoled him round with many a joke he eyed and grinned but never a sentence spoke but as old anne gave to a trusty care a dark print patch her daughter was to wear when she was wed to thomas the next fair he gazed as stupid at rebecca's face as parsons do at partridge during grace old anne plied round her beverage and her chin with care received the snuff which trickled in each had some tale of scandal or some news that each spoke foremost lest the rest should lose how drunken samson beat his precious rib how strangely susan looked and yet would fib how johnny simmons wife had brought him twins how oft the three balls lady patty wins who since she came a lady to be sure had never deigned to visit any poor a pale-faced hussy moping night and day who never went out but for to pledge or pray perhaps some mistress of discarded eye in treaty with some dastard tradesman nigh arrest your foul aspersions daring throng and learn her value from the poet's song amelia gentle educated mild of peerless beauty and an only child was won by villain arnold for to wed and share the honours of a captain's bed invented tales were told her and to climes of india goes the soldier other crimes on other beauties practised take her place her pittance stopped on her languid face pale throne sits sorrow feeding on her sighs and drinking up the lustre of her eyes as time an iron-hearted tyrant stands and grins to see her wring her lily hands when from the post returned and still ill sped she fancies horrors thinks her arnold dead as cloistered on her knees with fastened door her peerless virtues mangled by the poor End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Misgivings by Herman Melville. Read for LibriVox.org by Scott McKinley in Landing, New Jersey. When ocean clouds over inland hills sweep storming and late autumn brown and horror the sodden valley fills and the spire falls crashing in the town i muse upon my country's ills the tempest bursting from the waste of time on the world's fairest hope linked with man's foulest crime nature's dark side is heeded now ah optimist cheer disheartened flown a child may read the moody brow of yon black mountain lone with shouts the torrents down the gorges go and storms are formed behind the storm we feel the hemlock shakes in the rafter the oak in the driving keel. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Night Peace to Julia by Robert Herrick Read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Kennedy Her eyes the glowworm lend thee, The shooting stars attend thee, And the elves also whose little eyes glow Like sparks of fire befriend thee. No will-o'-the-wisp mislight thee, No snake or slow worm bite thee, But on, on thy way, not making a stay, Since ghost there's none to affright thee. Let not the dark thee cumber, What though the moon does slumber, The stars of the night will lend thee their light, Like tapers clear without number. Then, Julia, let me woo thee, Thus, thus, to come unto me, And when I shall meet thy silvery feet, My soul I'll pour into thee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. On the Death of Mrs. Bowes by Lady Mary Wortley Montague Read for LibriVox.org by Edmund Agabau Hail, happy bride, for thou art truly blessed. Three months of rapture, crowned with endless rest, Merit like yours was heaven's peculiar care. You loved yet tasted happiness sincere. To you the sweets of love were only shown, the sure succeeding bitter dregs unknown. You had not yet the fatal change deplored, the tender lover for the imperious lord, nor felt the pain that jealous fondness brings, nor felt the coldness from possession springs. Above your sex, distinguished in your fate, you trusted yet experienced no deceit. Soft were your hours, and winged with pleasure flew. No vain repentance gave a sign to you, and if superior bliss heaven can bestow, with fellow angels you enjoy it now. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ozymandias by Percy Bysshe Shelley Read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Gantz I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand half sunk, a shattered visage lies whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Pisistratus's Rule of Athens by Solon, 630 to 560 BC, from the Lives and Opinions of Eminent Philosophers by Diogenes Laertius, read for LibriVox.org. If through your vices you afflicted are, lay not the blame of your distress on God. You made your rulers mighty, gave them guards. So now you groan neath slavery's heavy rod. Each one of you now treads in fox's steps, bearing a weak, inconstant, faithless mind, trusting the tongue and slippery speech of man, though in his acts alone you truth can find. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Poor Knight by Alexander Pushkin As adapted in The Idiot by Fyodor Dostoevsky Read for LibriVox.org by Cheska
Once there came a vision glorious, mystic, dreadful, wondrous, fair, burnt itself into a spirit, and abode forever there. Never more from that sweet moment gazed he on womankind. He was dumb to love and wooing, and to all their graces blind. Full of love for that sweet vision, brave and pure, he took the field. With his blood he stained the letters, NPB, upon his shield. Lumincelli, Santa Rosa, shouting on the foe he fell, and like thunder rang his war cry, or the cowering infidel. Then within his distant castle, home returned, he dreamed his days, silent, sad, and when death took him, he was mad, the legend says. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Pythagoras and the Dog by Xenophanes, 570 to 475 BC. From the Lives and Opinions of Eminent Philosophers by Diogenes Laertius. Read for LibriVox.org. They say that once, as passing by, he saw a dog severely beaten. He did pity him, and spoke as follows to the man who beat him. Stop now, and beat him not, since in his body abides the soul of a dear friend of mine, whose voice I recognized as he was crying. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Rainbow by William Worsthorpe A LibriVox recording Read by Tasbiha Tunnul My heart leapt up when I beheld A rainbow in the sky So was it when my love began So is it now I am a man So be it when I shall grow old Or let me die The child is father of the man and I could wish my day to be bound each to each by natural piety. The end of the rainbow. The recording will be in the public domain. The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. Read for LibriVox.org by Ethan. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor,' I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. "'Only this, and nothing more.' Ah, distinctly I remember, it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow, from my book's surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here for evermore and the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is, and nothing more. Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. "'Sir,' said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore, but the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there, wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whisper word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore. 
Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, soon again I heard a tapping, somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see, then, what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when, with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven, wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore, for we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door, with such name as Nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on the placid bust, spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing farther than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, Other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, Nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken, Doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock and store, caught from some unhappy master whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore of never never more but the raven still beguiling all my fancy into smiling straight i wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door then upon the velvet sinking i betook myself to linking fancy unto fancy thinking what this ominous bird of yore what this grim ungainly ghastly gaunt and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking nevermore this i sat engaged in guessing but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core this and more i sat divining with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er she shall press ah never more then methought the air grew denser perfumed from an unseen censer swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor wretch i cried thy god hath lent thee by these angels he hath sent thee respite respite and nepenthe from thy memories of lenore quaff o oh, quaff this kind nepenthe and forget this lost lenore quoth the raven nevermore prophet said i thing of evil prophet still if bird or devil whether tempter sent or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore desolate yet all undaunted on this desert land enchanted on this home by horror haunted tell me truly i implore is there is there balm in gilead tell me tell me i implore quoth the raven nevermore prophet said i thing of evil prophet still if bird or devil by that heaven that bends above us by that god we both adore tell this soul with sorrow laden if within the distant aden it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels name lenore clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name lenore quoth the raven nevermore 
be that word our sign of parting bird or fiend i shrieked upstarting get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken leave my loneliness unbroken quit the bust above my door take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door quoth the raven nevermore and the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting, on the pallid bust of Pallas, just above my chamber door, and his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him, streaming, throws his shadow on the floor, and my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Reconciliation by George William Russell. Read for LibriVox.org by Laiba Noor. I begin through the grass once again to be bound to the Lord. I can see through a face that has faded, the face full of rest of the earth, of the mother my heart with her heart in accord as i lie amid the cool green tresses that mantle her breasts i begin with the grass once again to be found to the lord by the hand of a child i am led to the throne of the king for a touch that now fevers me not is forgotten and far and his infinite has kept her hands that sways can bring me in dreams from the laugh of a child to the song of a star on the laugh of a child i am born to the joy of the king end of poem this recording is in the public domain the remedy worse than the disease by matthew pryor Read for LibriVox.org by Ike Scher. I sent for Ratcliffe, was so ill that other doctors gave me over. He felt my pulse, prescribed his pill, and I was likely to recover. But when the wit began to wheeze, and wine had warmed the politician, cured yesterday of my disease, I died last night of my physician. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Sight in Camp in the Daybreak Grey and Dim by Walt Whitman Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp a sight in camp in the daybreak, gray and dim, As from my tent I emerge so early, sleepless, As slow I walk in the cool, fresh air, The path near by the hospital tent. Three forms I see on stretchers lying, Brought out there, untended, lying. Over each the blanket spread, Ample, brownish, woolen blanket, Gray and heavy blanket, folding, covering all. Curious, I halt and silent stand. Then with light fingers, I from the face of the nearest, the first, just lift the blanket. Who are you, elderly man, so gaunt and grim, with well-grayed hair and flesh all sunken about the eyes? Who are you, my dear comrade? Then to the second I stepped. And who are you? My child and darling, who are you, sweet boy, with cheeks yet blooming? Then to the third, a face nor child nor old, very calm, as of beautiful yellow-white ivory. Young man, I think I know you. I think this face is the face of the Christ himself, dead and divine and brother of all. And here again he lies. And a poem. This recording is in the public domain.
The Singing Woman from the Woods Edge by Edna St. Vincent Millay Recorded for LibriVox.org by Chandra Homan What should I be but a prophet and a liar, Whose mother was a leprechaun, whose father was a friar, Teethed on a crucifix and cradled under water, What should I be but a fiend's goddaughter? And who should be my playmates but the adder and the frog, that was got beneath a furze bush and born in a bog. And what should be my singing that was christened at an altar, but aves and credos and psalms out of psalter? You will see such webs on the wet grass, maybe, as a pixie mother weaves for her baby. You will find such flame at the wave's weedy ebb as flashes in the meshes of a mare mother's web. But there comes to birth no common spawn from the love of a priest and a leprechaun. And you have never seen, and you never will see, such things as the things that swaddled me. After all's said, and after all's done, what should I be but a harlot and a nun? In through the bushes on foggy days, my da would come a swishin' of the drops away, with a prayer for my death and a groan for my birth, a mumbling of his beads for all he was worth. And there sit my ma, her knees beneath her chin, a looking in his face and a drinking of it in, and a marking in the moss some funny little saying that would mean just the opposite of all he was praying. He taught me the holy talk of Vesper and of Mitten. He heard me my Greek and he heard me my Latin. He blessed me and crossed me to keep my soul from evil. And we watched him out of sight and we conjured up the devil. Oh, the things I haven't seen, and the things I haven't known, but with hedges and ditches till after I was grown, and yanked both ways by my mother and my father, with a which would you better, and a which would you rather, with him for a sire, and her for a dam, what should I be but just what I am? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Song to the Man of England by Percy Bysshe Shelley Read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Kennedy Men of England, wherefore plow For the lords who lay ye low? Wherefore weave with toil and care The rich robes your tyrants wear? Wherefore feed and clothe and save From the cradle to the grave Those ungrateful drones who would Drain your sweat, nay, drink your blood. Wherefore bees of England forge Many a weapon, chain, and scourge That these stingless drones may spoil The forced produce of your toil. Have ye leisure, comfort, calm, Shelter food, love's gentle balm? Or what is it ye buy so dear With your pain and with your fear? The seed ye sow another reaps, the wealth ye find another keeps, the robes ye weave another wears, the arms ye forge another bears. Sow seed, but let no tyrant reap, find wealth, let no impostor heap, weave robes, let not the idle wear, forge arms in your defense to bear. Shrink to your cellars, holes, and cells, in halls ye deck another dwells. Why shake the chains ye wrought? Ye see, the steel ye tempered glance on ye. With plow and spade and hoe and loom, trace your grave and build your tomb and weave your winding sheet till fair England be your sepulchre. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 38 From The Growth of Love by Robert Bridges Read for LibriVox.org by Aaron Grassy An idle June day on the sunny Thames Floating or rowing as our fancy led now in the high beams basking as we sped, Now in the green shade gliding by mirrored stems, 
by lock and weir and isle, and many a spot of memoried pleasure. Glad with strength and skill, friendship, good wine and mirth, that serve not ill the heavenly muse, though she requite them not. I would have life, thou saidest, all as this day, simple enjoyment, calm in its excess, with not a grief to cloud, and not a ray of passion overhot my peace to oppress, with no ambition to reproach delay, nor rapture to disturb its happiness. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 4 by William Shakespeare. Read for LibriVox.org by Garfield D'Souza. Unthrifty loveliness, why dost thou spend upon thyself thy beauty's legacy? Nature's bequest gives nothing but doth lend, and being frank, she lends to those are free. Then, beauteous niggard, why dost thou abuse the bounteous largess given thee to give? Profitless usurer, why dost thou use so great a sum of sums, yet canst not live? For having traffic with thyself alone, thou of thyself, thy sweet self, dost deceive. Then how, when nature calls thee to be gone, what acceptable audit canst thou leave? Thy unused beauty must be doomed with thee, which, used, lives the executor to be. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 5 by William Shakespeare Read for LibriVox.org by Garfield D'Souza those hours that with gentle work did frame the lovely gaze where every eye that dwell will play the tyrants to the very same and that unfair which fairly doth excel for never resting time leads summer on to hideous winter and confounds him there sap checked with frost and lusty leaves quite gone beauty o oh, snowed and bareness everywhere then were not summer's distillation left, a liquid prisoner bent in walls of glass. Beauty's effect with beauty were bereft, nor it, nor no remembrance what it was. But flowers distilled, though they would winter meet, leaves but their show, their substance still lives sweet. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 6 by William Shakespeare Read for LibriVox.org by Garfield D'Souza Then let not winter's ragged hand efface in thee thy summer, ere thou be distilled. Make sweet some while, treasure thou some place with beauty's treasure, ere it be self-killed. That use is not forbidden usury, which happies those that pay the willing loan. That's for thyself to breed another thee, or ten times happier, be it ten for one. Ten times thyself were happier than thou art. If ten of thine ten times refigured thee, then what could death do if thou shouldst depart, leaving thee living in posterity? Be not self-willed, for thou art much too fair to be death's conquest and make worms thine heir. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 70 On being cautioned against walking on an headland overlooking the sea because it was frequented by a lunatic. By Charlotte Smith. Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp. Is there a solitary wretch who hies to the tall cliff with starting pace or slow, and measuring views with wild and hollow eyes its distance from the waves that chide below, 
who, as the sea-born gale with frequent sighs, chills his cold bed upon the mountain turf, with hoarse half-uttered lamentation, lies murmuring responses to the dashing surf. In moody sadness on the giddy brink, I see him more with envy than with fear. He has no nice felicities that shrink from giant horrors wildly wandering here. He seems, uncursed with reason, not to know the depth or the duration of his woe. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Sonnet of the Moon by Charles Best Read for LibriVox.org by Gabrielle Kumar Look how the pale queen of the silent night doth cause the ocean to attend upon her, and he, as long as she is in his sight, with her full tide is ready her to honor. But when the silver wagon of the moon is mounted up so high he cannot follow, the sea calls home his crystal waves to moan, and with low ebb doth manifest his sorrow. So you that are the sovereign of my heart have all my joys attending on your will, my joys low ebbing when you do depart, when you return their tide my heart doth fill. So as you come and as you do depart, joys ebb and flow within my tender heart. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening by Robert Frost Read for LibriVox.org by Ethan Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near. Between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark, and deep, but I have promises to keep, and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Sweetness of Life by Archibald Lampman Read for LibriVox.org It fell on a day I was happy, In the winds, the concave sky, The flowers and the beasts in the meadow Seemed happy, even as I, And I stretched my hands to the meadow, To the bird, the beast, the tree. Why are ye all so happy? I cried, and they answered me. What sayest thou, O meadow, that stretches so wide, so far, that none can say how many thy misty marguerites are. And what say ye, red roses, that o'er the sun-blanched wall, from your high black shadowed trellis, like flame or blood drops fall? We are born, we are reared, and we linger a various space and die. We dream and are bright and happy, but we cannot answer why. What sayest thou, O shadow? that from the dreaming hill, all down the broadening valley, liest so sharp and still. And thou, O murmuring brooklet, whereby in the noonday gleam, the loose strife burns like ruby, and the branched asters dream. We are born, we are reared, and we linger, a various space, and die. We dream, and are very happy, but we cannot answer why. And then of myself I questioned, that like a ghost the while stood for me and calmly answered with slow and curious smile thou art born as the flowers and wilt linger thine own short space and die thou streamest and art strangely happy but thou canst not answer why end of poem this recording is in the public domain the teacher by leslie pinckney hill Read for LibriVox.org by Mike Overby, Midland, Washington. 
Lord, who am I to teach the way to little children day by day, so prone myself to go astray? I teach them knowledge, but I know how faint they flicker and how low the candles of my knowledge glow. I teach them power to will and do, but only now to learn anew my own great weakness through and through. I teach them love for all mankind and all God's creatures, but I find my love comes lagging far behind. Lord, if their guide I still must be, O oh, let the little children see the teacher leaning hard on thee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To See by Mary Young Sewell Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia To See on his acknowledging an error in his first poetical collection. As glowing Phoebus with his morning beam dispels the fiction of the elusive dream, so heavenly truth with clear refulgent light bursts through the gloom of intellectual night, and pure with radiance from her morning sky bids the pale form of cheerless error fly. Blessed be the day, forever blessed the hour, when Carlo's breast confessed her sacred power. The conscious muse her triumph shall impart, a worthy offering is thy conquered heart. O oh, mayest thou ever own her sacred claim, and blend the Christians with the poet's name. While servile bards their abject course pursue, and fashion gives the price to genius due, while sordid interest plays her odious part, and makes the generous muse a child of art. To praise, to blame, to flatter by design, and form dissimulation's flowing line, while subtle mischief with destructive powers adorns the precipice with tempting flowers, thine be the task to guide unthinking youth, to scatter roses in the path of truth. Thine be the task fair virtue to imprint, and paint her graces with the softest tint. With soothing care the tortured soul to calm, and heal her wounds with hope's delicious balm. Since here adversity the storm shall bring to rend the plumage from her golden wing, canst thou not teach her, gentle bard, to rise on eagle pinions to her native skies? Approving virtue would herself prepare the immortal wreath to recompense thy care. Though nature frowns, serene shall be her light, and beam resplendent through a world of night. To reason's view, the rich, the proud, the gay, and life's deceiving trifles fade away. Its golden prize to wisdom seems entwined within the casket of the purest mind. Best can it feel affection's gentle power, the soothing welcome, and the social hour. May such be thine, till calm reflection's ray shines over the evening of thy golden day. And, oh, when death its sable curtain draws, may glorious virtue find thee in her cause. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To the Nightingale by Walter Savage Landor Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk Gale of the night, our fathers called thee bird. Surely not rude were they who called thee so, whether mid springtide mirth thy song they heard, or whether its soft gurgle melted woe. They knew not, heeded not, that every clime hath been attempered by thy minstrelsy. They knew not, heeded not, from earliest time how every poet's nest was warmed by thee. In paradise's unpolluted bowers did Milton listen to thy freshest strain. In his own night didst thou assuage the hours when crime and tyranny were crowned again. Melodious Shelley caught thy softest song, and they who heard his music 
heard not thine gentle and joyous delicate and strong from the far tomb his voice shall silence mine end of poem this recording is in the public domain the two coffins by eugene field read for LibriVox.org by m lee in yonder old cathedral two lovely coffins lie in one the head of the state lies dead and a singer sleeps hard by once had that king great power and proudly ruled the land his crowning now is on his brow and his sword is in his hand how sweetly sleeps the singer with calmly folded eyes and on the breast of the bard at rest the harp that he sounded lies the castle walls are falling and war distracts the land but the sword leaps not from that mildewed spot there in that dead king's hand but with every grace of nature there seems to float along to cheer again the hearts of men the singer's deathless song and of poem this recording is in the public domain the tiger by william blake read for librivox.org by christine wales the tiger 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 burning bright in the forests of the night what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry in what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes on what wings dare he aspire what the hand dare seize the fire and what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart and when thy heart began to beat what dread hand and what dread feet what the hammer what the chain in what furnace was thy brain what the anvil what dread grasp dare its deadly terrors clasp when the stars threw down their spheres and watered heaven with their tears did he smile his work to see did he who made the lamb make thee tiger tiger burning bright in the forests of the night what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry end of poem this recording is in the public domain the village blacksmith by henry wadsworth longfellow read for LibriVox.org by steve under a spreading chestnut tree the village smithy stands the smith a mighty man is he with large and sinewy hands and the muscles of his brawny arms are strong as iron bands his hair is crisp and black and long his face is like the tan his brow is wet with honest sweat he earns whate'er he can and looks the whole world in the face for he owes not any man week in week out from morn till night you can hear his bellows blow you can hear him swing his heavy sledge with measured beat and slow like a sexton ringing the village bell when the evening sun is low and children coming home from school look in at the open door they love to see the flaming forge and hear the bellows roar and catch the burning sparks that fly like chaff from a threshing floor he goes on sunday to the church and sits among his boys he hears the parson pray and preach he hears his daughter's voice singing in the village choir and it makes his heart rejoice it sounds to him like her mother's voice singing in paradise he needs must think of her once more how in the grave she lies and with his hard rough hand he wipes a tear out of his eyes toiling rejoicing sorrowing onward through life he goes each morning sees some task begin each evening sees it close something attempted something done has earned a night's repose 
thanks thanks to thee my worthy friend for the lesson thou hast taught thus at the flaming forge of life our fortunes must be wrought thus on its sounding anvil shaped each burning deed and thought end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Virgin Mother by George William Russell, read for LibriVox.org by Christine Wales. The Virgin Mother. Who is that goddess to whom men should pray, but her from whom their hearts have turned away? Out of whose virgin being they were born, whose mother nature they have named in scorn, calling its holy substance common clay. Yet from this so despised earth was made, the milky whiteness of those queens who swayed, their generations with a light caress, and from some image of whose loveliness the heart built up high heaven when it prayed lover your heart the heart on which it lies your eyes on that gaze and those alluring eyes your lips the lips they kiss alike had birth within this dark divinity of earth within this mother being you despise ah when i think this earth on which we tread hath borne those blossoms of the lovely dead and made the living heart i love to beat i look with sudden awe beneath my feet as with you erring reverence overhead end of poem this recording is in the public domain when i was one and twenty by a e houseman read for LibriVox .org by Ike Scher. When I was one and twenty, I heard a wise man say, Give crowns and pounds and guineas, but not your heart away. Give pearls away and rubies, but keep your fancy free. But I was one and twenty, no use to talk to me. When I was one and twenty, I heard him say again, the heart out of the bosom was never given in vain. Tis paid with sighs aplenty, and sold for endless rue. And I am two and twenty, and oh, tis true, tis true. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Witch Wife by Edna St. Vincent Millay Read for LibriVox.org by E. J. Lavery She is neither pink nor pale, and she never will be all mine. She learned her hands in a fairy tale, and her mouth on a valentine. She has more hair than she needs. In the sun tis a woe to me, and her voice is a string of colored beads or steps leading into the sea. She loves me all that she can, and her ways to my ways resign. But she was not made for any man, and she never will be all mine. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Women by Louise Bogan Read by Chandra Homan for LibriVox.org Women have no wilderness in them, they are provident instead, content in the tight hot cell of their hearts to eat dusty bread. They do not see cattle cropping red winter grass, they do not hear snow water going down under culverts shallow and clear, they wait when they should turn to journeys. They stiffen when they should bend. They use against themselves that benevolence to which no man is friend. They cannot think of so many crops to a field, or of clean wood cleft by an axe. Their love is an eager meaninglessness, too tense or too lax. They hear in every whisper that speaks to them a shout and a cry, as like as not when they take life over their dorsals. They should let it go by. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Written during a temporary blindness in the year 1799 by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp. Oh, what a life is the eye! What a strange and inscrutable essence! Him that is utterly blind, nor glimpses the fire that warms him, him that never beheld the swelling breast of his mother, him that smiled in his gladness as a babe that smiles in its slumber, even for him it exists, it moves and stirs in its prison, lives with a separate life, and is it a spirit? he murmurs. Sure, it has thoughts of its own, and to see is only a language. And a poem. This recording is in the public domain.